time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor and analyst, and Mr. Elliot Haynes of United Nations World. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. A. A. Burley, Jr., former United States Assistant Secretary of State. Mr. Burley, it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight, sir. Our viewers, of course, uh, uh, remember that you've been a student of this nation's foreign affairs back since the first war and back to Versailles. Now, recently, sir, on this program, uh, we had a guest who made some rather favorable uh, statements regarding the Franco regime in Spain. And tonight, sir, we'd appreciate your analyzing rather realistically uh, some of the things that are going on between our nation and Spain. First of all, sir, do you think that it's proper for our government to negotiate a pact with the Franco regime? Uh, yes. I know, of course, that there are many people who believe that the United States government should never negotiate treaties with governments of which it doesn't approve. That uh, rather limits your ability to act in international affairs. Well, Mr. Burley, is there a special need for us to negotiate a treaty with Spain? What do we need from Spain? Well, if I can finish the other statement, <coughs> It seems to me that it is always right for the United States to negotiate an agreement with another country, irrespective of what you may think of its government, up to the point where you are really following a common interest of both peoples. Now, in the Spanish case, the Spanish people undoubtedly want to be protected against, to have defense against Russian aggression, either direct by an army or by reason of a package revolution exported to them. We have a common interest in having them protected. That's the most one of the most valuable pieces of real estate in the world and has a tremendous strategic importance. You see, uh, you can lose all Europe, but if you hold the Mediterranean, you can reconquer the territory. That's happened several times in history. The uh, to that extent, therefore, and up to that point, the Spanish people and the American people have a common interest. Uh, well, now, Mr. Burley, um, there is this very definite need for some sort of a treaty between the two peoples in common defense. Do you think there's a danger in a democracy like our country making a uh, defensive treaty with a fascist dictatorship such as Spain? Yes, there is. For one thing, dictatorships are notoriously temporary, and they are succeeded by another government, a democratic or perhaps another dictatorship, pretty apt to undo exactly the arrangements that were made by the predecessor government. That's one difficulty. So that you might wind up by not having got precisely the result you wanted. Does uh, it? The second, which is a very solid moral difficulty, of course, is that uh, there is always a danger that in accomplishing a common interest, you may be construed as undertaking to create or back a force, both moral and political, uh, which uh, is going to weaken rather than strengthen you, quite irrespective well, of your moral judgment. Well, sir, on, on that point, if we make a pact with Spain and if we spend money in Spain, does it necessarily follow that we, we as a nation strengthen the Franco regime? Uh, no, I don't think it does. Uh, I think that in that respect, uh, if negotiations are well handled, the common interest can be maintained without committing either Franco to American democracy, which he won't do, or committing us to a Franco fascism, which uh, our public opinion would not uh, allow us to do. Well, then you don't think even the most uh, liberal-minded American could uh, uh, object to the sort of a treaty which the Americans are now negotiating with Spain? I can't say. 
We're talking about an agreement that hasn't been negotiated yet. We don't know what it is. It might be a good idea, before everybody gets so very vigorous about it, to find out exactly what we're talking about. As I understand it, uh, the last uh, negotiations really uh, encountered difficulties because uh, the uh, Franco government wanted the United States government to go a great deal farther in working with its army on re-equipment. There, you were getting into Spanish politics. And uh, as I understood it, the American government did not wish to do that. With uh, reasonable common sense, it ought to be possible, I think, to get back to the point of common interest. Well, now, and in your opinion, sir, what our government should seek is the basis we need. But you'd, I gather that you do not believe we should go too far in building up the Spanish armed forces themselves. On the whole lot, I uh, don't feel that we ought at this stage of affairs to assume great responsibility for the Spanish army. Whether a way could be found by which it could be done within the framework of the kind of European army we're building elsewhere, I don't know. Uh, it is possible <coughs> that with first-class headwork, the Spanish army could be somehow handled within the framework of a European army defense so that it would not be uh, also building up uh, a, an instrument for one or another party in Spain. Now, Mr. Burley, I'd like to change the subject a little bit to another hot spot in the world, Latin America. You've had quite a bit of experience in that region of the world. Uh, it appears that the United States' relations with Latin America are growing very bad. Do you think this is true? Well, you're talking diplomatic language there. Our relations with them are not bad. Our relations with them are, uh, as the diplomats say, deteriorating. So this is a different... Uh, so it's, it's quite a large any, uh, difference. Are there particular countries where they're growing very uh, poor? Well, I can take three situations that are on my mind at the moment. <coughs> the first is the situation in Guatemala. There, a government... Uh, very thinly disguised as uh, democratic, is actually controlled by communist elements and is carrying on a vigorous communist campaign against us and intriguing against their neighbor states. That is in Central America, perilously close to the Panama Canal. Now that is a case where we ought to be working on it, preferably with the goodwill and concurrence of the neighbor states we're equally worried. Uh, Another situation, of course, is in Brazil. There, the debt negotiations to provide foreign exchange to cover the uh, over-importation of goods of Brazil uh, were moving along during the post-election period and the incoming uh, government now. They uh, fell to pieces, more or less, uh, or at least were not followed up with the result that some blighter has now attached the Brazilian gold reserve in the Federal Reserve Bank, which is a scandalous proceeding anyway, and of course the Brazilian newspapers are uh, making a great deal about the insult to Brazil and one thing and another. Now that means that uh, somebody's got to get to work fast. Well, Mr. Burley, do you have one suggestion by which you think that we could improve our relations or recover the situation in South America? Yes, I do. I think that there ought to be a high-level American official charged with taking care of those relations all the time. I should like to have them of cabinet or sub-cabinet rank. If I were doing it myself, I'd like to have a Secretary of State for the Hemisphere acting under the Secretary of State, but having a seat in the cabinet just as the Secretary for Air or the Army does well, uh, under the Secretary of well, Defense. Well, sir, our, our viewers hear so many uh, grim expressions on this program, sir. From your long experience, I wonder if you could offer us uh, some little hope do you see some things that are going our way in the world now? Yes, I do. We've taken two very grim and difficult situations, and not the grimmest or the most difficult on this program. But I'm beginning to feel better about the situation for the first time in a long time. There are various reasons for it, but two will do. The Europeans are beginning to pull themselves together. Economically, their condition is better, Monet was successful in bringing them together in the European coal community. 
and I still believe that they will pull together in the European army. That's a solid piece of advance. On the other side of the Iron Curtain, uh, I think the Russians have finally cracked. The anti-Semitic campaign, infernal as it is, is a hopeful sign in that respect. For when they did that, they overtly abandoned their own revolution. It stopped being a universal religion offering uh, hope and became a straight power mechanism in which one race will uh, endeavor to make itself the master of another race. Then you think that the anti-Semitic campaign uh, in Russia will make it harder for Russia to win converts in the West? I am very clear that that will be the result. When a revolution denies itself, it loses force as a revolution. It still can make a great deal of trouble as an army. It can still uh, mean a great deal of blood, sweat, and tears to conquer the imperialism. But the universal appeal is gone, and the light has gone out. And never in history has a revolution converted into an imperialism succeeded for a very long time after it has denied itself. Now, well, well, sir, I'm, uh, I'm sure that our audience is extremely grateful to you, sir, for these, uh, for this excellent analysis and particularly for these very hopeful words and thank you for being with us sir. the opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own the editorial board for this edition of the Longines chronoscope was mr. William Bradford Huey and mr. Elliot Haynes our distinguished guest was mr. A. A. Burley jr. former United States assistant secretary of state The pleasure of receiving a Longines watch is surpassed only by the pride that comes from owning one. For owning a Longines watch is like owning a thoroughbred, a champion, the very best in its class. Yes, only Longines among the world's finest watches has won so many honors for elegance, excellence, and accuracy in international competitions, at world's fairs, and at the great government observatories. Remember, too, that Longines is the most honored watch in sport, in aviation, and science. The perfect craftsmanship of the Longines watch is evidenced in its faultless performance as a timepiece and in its rare beauty as a piece of fine jewelry. And yet, unbelievably, you may buy and own or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. And mark you this, if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longines. Why not insist on getting a Longines? The world's most honored watch. The world's most honored gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. I invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Challenging Entertainment, Omnibus on the CBS television network.